Now church growth and development is a field of study that has uh, actually produced a lot of theories, a lot of books, uh, seminars on the subject, like this one here is a seminar on church growth. Perhaps the difference is this one is squarely based on very specific types of, uh, not types, but very specific scriptures that deal with the growth of the church. But nevertheless, it's a big field. A lot of books come out every year about church growth. And no wonder, no wonder that church growth books and seminars are a growing industry uh, with less and less people attending services and more, you know, a more secular society. Uh, churches are in decline. Not, not just churches of Christ are not growing the way they should or in decline, but all groups, all religious groups, their uh, churches are in decline and they're searching for ways to not only win souls or new converts, but also to maintain and uh, motivate existing members. So church growth stuff is a growth industry in itself. But a lot of what has been written comes from ministers of large, what we call mega churches, who have packaged their, you know, their various growth formulas into books and seminars, which propose to help churches you know, reproduce in their own congregation the success that the mega churches have had. So you have a mega church and they say, this is our system, this is how we've done it, and so on and so forth, and here's uh, you know, 60 lessons and a book and tape, and so on and so forth, and if you do what we do, if you, if you take the approach we take, then you'll have the success that, that, that we have. Now, the problem with this is that Research has shown that trying to reproduce a growth model by simply copying the system or the approach of another church rarely works. Rarely works. This is why there's only, like, there's only one Saddleback church or there's only one Willow Creek church. You hear about Willow Creek, 10,000 members. But how many of those are there? There's only one. They, 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 they export their system to all kinds of churches, but there's still only one of them. They're a hybrid. In our uh, fellowship, right, in the Churches of Christ, you know, how many memorial roads do you know that you can name? In one? How many 3,000 member church that you know of? Well, there's that, and there's Highland, and a couple in Dallas, and a few in Tennessee, and so on and so forth. You know? uh, there are not that many. I mentioned before that the average growth is about two, uh, the average size is about 200 people. Now the reason that just exporting your system uh, doesn't work is that uh, those growth churches, those huge mega churches are unique to their time and place and cannot be multiplied simply by copying their structure or implementing their programs. It just doesn't work. Now this is not to say that there are not valuable resources you know, that these churches can provide. There are. There is one book um, that is the result of an exhaustive research project about church growth around the world that I think is very valuable. Like I say, not everything is bad. There are a lot of good ideas and one book in particular has really terrific ideas. Um, a, um, a writer called Christian Schwartz. He's a researcher um, and he is a church growth researcher. He conducted the most extensive survey of churches around the world. He surveyed a thousand different churches of every type and every size in 32 countries with over four million responses to analyze. Now if you're a researcher, if you've done any type of research or surveying, you, you need to understand a thousand different institutions from 32 countries, four million respondents, I'm telling you that is an exhaustive research program. Well what did he want to know? Well he wanted to know what characteristics do growing churches share? That was his question. Okay? Now, do any of you remember a book that came out? It's still on the bestseller list, but there was a book that came out by a man named Stephen Covey a couple of years back, and he wrote a book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Do you remember that book? Very popular book. As I say, if you look at the list, it's still on the bestseller list, down number nine or 10. Stephen Covey, 
uh, poured over 200 years of success literature. How to succeed and so on and so forth. You know, he analyzed that kind of literature 200 years worth in the form of biographies and systems and profiles of successful people from every walk of life. And what Stephen Covey did is he distilled all of this information down to seven key character traits that all successful people share regardless of time, regardless of culture. So whether you lived in England in the 18th century or in California in the 19th century or in Africa in the 20th century, you know, no matter where you lived or where you were, successful people shared certain characteristics, regardless of their culture, the time they lived, or the society that they uh, lived in. His findings confirm the important idea that success is not about how much you acquire or how much you succeed, but rather what kind of person you are. That's what he found out. In other words, character over quantity, principles over production. Well, in the, name, in the very same way, Christian Schwartz has done a similar thing with the subject of church growth. His research has revealed that growing churches, all growing churches, regardless of country or position on the doctrinal issues that they have, all of them share eight specific quality characteristics and they possess these at a level far above non-growing churches. Now remember, when I say a thousand churches, I'm not talking about a thousand churches of Christ. I'm talking about Catholic churches, Methodist churches, Presbyterian churches, Baptists, Southern Baptists, Missionary Baptists, churches of Christ, Christian church, disciple. You know, he, he went through all the different churches. And so the results were very specific about two points. One, not only did growing churches possess these eight quality characteristics, and it didn't matter which group it was, whether it was a growing Catholic church or a growing church of Christ, it didn't matter, they all possessed the very same characteristics. And they had these characteristics or exercised them at a rate or level that was far above those churches who merely had some or all of the characteristics, but their level or practice of achievement of these were low. In other words, some churches had all of these characteristics, but the plates were spinning very, very slowly. You understand what I'm saying? All right, so I'd like to briefly share these with you today. Now before I give you these, I want to explain the difference between models for church growth and principles for church growth. Not the same thing. Number one, a model is an existing congregation that for whatever reason has experienced success and church growth. A model. The systems that are used in the model are then copied in other, uh, you know, in other places in order to apply them to churches hoping to make them grow. In other words, Saddleback will export its system to another church so that they can copy their system. That's a model. Okay? Now we've done that too. Madison, remember the Madison Church of Christ in the 1960s was the largest congregation of the churches of Christ. It far surpassed some of the big ones today. It had nearly 6,000 people in Madison, Tennessee. And it had systems, you know, they were exporting their system to other churches who couldn't quite replicate the 6,000 people model. Okay? The second idea is a principle. A principle is something that applies to every church at all times. It's generic, it's biblical, it's universal in its application. So what we're talking about here is not a model, it's a principle. Church models are usually seen in a few very successful and innovative churches that have like a high profile and what they do is they export their model for others to copy. Church principles are seen in many, many churches of all sizes and shapes and they promote a more natural approach to church growth. So what's my point? My point is the following. 
Instead of copying a successful model, we should implement principles and characteristics that all growing churches have and all growing churches share in the natural growth that they experience. We're about principles, we're not about models. All right, one last explanation before I share the list with you. The researchers also discovered that growing churches not only shared eight similar characteristics and experienced them to a certain high level, they also learned that each characteristic had a particular quality. For example, a person is not just a skater, she's a, a figure skater or a speed skater, you see a, a quality to the skill. Or a man is not just intelligent, he's intelligent in math or he's a genius in physics. All right? A quality to the characteristics. And you'll see what I mean when I go through these. So each characteristic that they found had a specific quality to it that contributed directly to the growth of that church. So here are the eight quality characteristics shared by all growing churches, based in research now. Number one, all growing churches had empowering leadership. Do you see the breakdown? Not just leadership, all churches have leadership in one way or another, but growing churches had empowering leadership. In other words, leaders of growing churches concentrate on empowering other Christians for ministry. So let me give you an example. Empowering leaders don't just enlist members to help them achieve their personal ministry goal or visions. They assist members in developing their own giftedness and they mentor them in reaching their own spiritual goal. So let, give me, I'll, let me give you an example of this type of thing. Leaders visit members, but empowering leaders bring a member with them to visit other members and train them in personal work. See the difference? See the difference? Leaders teach and evangelize but empowering leaders are always on the lookout to find and to disciple members who have these gifts and provide opportunities for them to use these gifts. See the difference? Not just leadership, empowering leadership. Empowering leaders invest most of their time in discipleship, delegation, and multiplication. Our research shows that empowering leaders are not the superstars of megachurches. You know, one of the problems with having a superstar, the superstar preacher or the superstar youth minister or the superstar whatever, is that when the superstar leaves, what happens? Everything that the superstar did goes down the drain. That's what happens with a superstar. But if you have an empowering leadership, even if that leader leaves, he or she, because women in the church serve as well and in many instances they also have leadership in a ministry area, these people have empowered others to continue the work and the ministry after they leave. So after they leave, someone else steps in. Okay? Um, so um, research shows, as I say, that empowering leaders are not the superstars of mega churches, but rather people who know how to cultivate spiritual qualities in other people. It's okay if you don't get around to, seven, to seeing 70 people. If you manage to mentor two or three, that's pretty good. That's a good, you know, I always say Jesus only had 12 <laughs> apostles, just 12. He was the son of God and he had just 12 apostles and one of them didn't work out real well. <laughs> So I'm not going to beat myself up if I can't manage uh, you know, personal, deep mentoring relationships with 29 or 54 people. If the Lord could only manage 12, uh, who am I to try to do 50? Now a couple of other interesting findings based on the research in, in the area of leadership were the following. 
Formal theological training had a negative effect on church growth. Isn't that weird? In other words, the more theological training of the leaders, the less growth. Now when I say theological training, I'm not talking about Bible training. I'm talking about theological training. The discussion of the various philosophies of religion and what it means. And some people say, well, why is that? Probably because most institutions of higher learning that offer postgraduate and graduate degrees in theology and so on and so forth are extremely liberal. Like if you go to Harvard and you get a PhD in theology, you'll probably come out not believing in God anymore. <laughs> Certainly not believing that the Bible is His word. And so people at that level of education, not all, but many of them, and I've met many of them, promote the idea of pluralism. Everybody's going to heaven. Let's make friends with everybody. The Bible, however, is very clear about that. The Bible and Christianity is an exclusive religion. It's very exclusive. It's one of the reasons why people hate Christians, because they dare to say, only Jesus is the one who can save you. As I mentioned before, Acts chapter 4, verse 12. You know, there is no other name under heaven by which you may be saved. And people don't like that. And so you know, as you get away from that idea, you make friends, but you don't make converts. And you don't grow the church of the Lord by denying the fact that He is the Son of God and His word is not the word of God. In other words, leaders who recognize that they needed, well, one other thing I forgot to mention. Um, um, research also showed that there was a positive relationship there we go. Uh, between the willingness of leaders to accept help from outside the congregation and the positive growth of the church. So those were two additional findings in the area of leadership. The more theological training, the less growth. And the second one is that leaders who sought help from outside the congregation, outside their circle, usually were ones who were leading growing churches. So leaders who recognized that they needed help to do their jobs usually succeeded better in building growing churches than those who thought they knew it all. Proving that humility is a key ingredient for successful, empowering leadership. All right, quality characteristic number two. Growing churches focused on gift-oriented ministry. Do you see the relationship? Not just people serving in ministry, but people serving in their area of giftedness, their area of strength. When people serve according to their giftedness, they're more likely to be serving in the power of the Lord and not according to their own strength. For professional ministers, identifying and training members in the use of their gifts should be a major part of their actual work. One of the jobs of a, of a minister is a, he's a scout, you know, like a baseball scout or a football scout. He's a scout. He's looking for talent. He's looking for people. There's a joke at Choctaw. You know? There's a kind of a running joke that goes, <laughs> no, he's smiling. There's a running joke that goes at Choctaw, even in our family, and Hal knows this joke as well, is don't ever ask Michael if there's something you can do, because he will find you something to do. Don't ever make that mistake. That's in the church and in our family, because you know, everybody's typing, doing filming, whatever. They're all doing something. All right. So um, for professional ministers, as I said, identifying and training members to use their gifts, this should be a major part of their work. Helping Christians identify and use their gifts contributes to church growth more than any other activity. More than any other activity they found. Building each other up builds the church. Quality characteristic number three. Growing churches experienced passionate spirituality. Now by passionate spirituality, I'm not talking about speaking in tongues or the rock and roll worship services with lights flashing and people jumping up and down. Jesus, Jesus, that's not what I'm talking about here. 
talking about, I'm not talking about a concert. The research showed that growing churches had members who care deeply about spiritual things. That's what I mean about passionate spirituality. They cared about Christ and they cared about their lives as Christians. It was important to them. Their passion was in pleasing and serving the Lord. That kind of passion. Now churches whose focus was only getting the forms right, you understand what I mean by the forms? In other words, churches that were only focused on the correct way of doing things, one cup, 16 cups, you know, two prayers, and then a song, the externals, the forms, these churches were not growing and they had little enthusiasm. And I dare say that's one of the main problems in the churches of Christ. We focus so long on the externals, we forgot about the guts of the thing. That's why my very first lesson, my very first Bible study with you about church growth was not in the book of Acts, it was in Ephesians. Because if we can be the church that Paul describes in Ephesians, we will be a loving church. We will have the New Testament pattern right there. So churches where the focus was on getting their lives right and getting their lives in sync with Christ found that their enthusiasm for all things, including the forms, promoted growth. I'm not saying let's do away with orderly worship service. And, you know, I'm not saying that at all. But when the goal is simply order and, you know, and we're in and we're out in an hour and let's not make any noise. And if that's the goal, then we've missed the boat. There's no passion in that. It's all externals. But if the goal is I want to be, I not only want to do what's right and, and be orderly and biblical in how I praise and worship God, but I want to be right with God. I want to deal with the sin in my life. I, 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 want to be, I want to be crazy about getting rid of the sin. I want to be ruthless. There's the word. I want to be ruthless in getting rid of the sin in my life. I want to be ruthless with it. I want to be sexually pure and I want to be ruthless about that. And I want to be kind and I want to be ruthless about that. Tamping down my ego and screwing down my pride. When people become ruthless about being Christians and how they treat each other, that's when the passion starts to come out. Quality characteristic number four. All growing churches had functional structures. Boy, when I read that, <laughs> that, that was one of the most happy moments in my ministry career when I read about the guy who was an expert in church research who, who had done a thing that I myself could never do and in his research he simply confirmed the thing that I had been teaching all along simply from looking at the scriptures for 10 years. Man, I said hallelujah. Every church has some kind of structure and organization but not all structures promote growth. That's what he said. Functional structures are those that promote church life and effective ministry and clear communication. Now what's interesting about this research is that it is, as I say, confirms statistically what I've been teaching about church organization and structure for many, many years in this Unlimited Growth Seminar. For example, that, most, that the most effective structure for the church is the one that is outlined for the church organization in Acts chapter 2. <laughs> it's so nice to get what you simply read from the book confirmed statistically and scientifically. We also learn, as we mentioned, we're not going over this again, there are five areas of ministry, evangelism, education, fellowship, worship, service, and when these are functioning properly and simultaneously, what happens? The church grows. So the research demonstrated that the closer to this organizational model the church was, the greater the growth. The further away you went from it, the growth stopped. Do I have Anecdotal personal experience, absolutely. Uh, in California, uh, 
You know, when I went there, they were 300. When I left there, they were 500. It wasn't me. It was just, hey, let's, same thing as we did here. You know, here's the ministry model. Start filling in the things. Let's start working. That's all. I just managed the system, taught them how to do it. Boom, it took off. Where did they come from? I don't know. I don't know. We baptized, you know, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 people a year, but people can't, you know, some people they, they poo-poo this idea of you know, people placing, oh, that's not growth. Really, that's not growth. Who do you think sent those people here? If God is in charge of everything, and if we ask God to give us uh, uh, guidance in the kingdom of God, brother and sister Smith, who moved from uh, Okima to, to Ponca City with their four kids, all of them Christians, all of them ready to serve in the Lord, you know, if that's not a blessing, I don't know what is. That's church growth. Somebody who stopped coming to church for three years and you know, away from the Lord, finally his conscience, her conscience you know, is convicted and returns and says, I want to be restored to the ministry of the Lord. I want to be restored to the church. I want to start serving again. That's growth. Spirit of God brought that person to us. So growth is they're baptized, they join, they're restored. Hey, it's all growth. Our job is not to decide what is growth and what isn't growth. Our job is to minister. That's our job. Don't worry about the growth. I'll tell you something else. It never comes from where you think it'll come. It never, never does. I'll tell you a story. So in Montreal, we we're having a gospel meeting and we we're having a college group, no, a church group from MacArthur Park Church of Christ in San Antonio. And there were a whole bunch of people, you know, there were like 30 or 40 of them, they came in a big bus, you know the drill, you know, the summer missions, you know, college teens, whatever. And we, my wife and I, you know, it was a small mission, we worked like dogs, I'm telling you, you know, printing stuff, delivering stuff, organizing these people, putting them up in houses, whatever. And they came and they knocked doors and they handed out 10,000 pamphlets and we invited a speaker, the whole drill, gospel meeting, you know. And uh, my wife said, you know, I've worked so hard on this, this gospel meeting with you. you know, I, I don't want to just stay home. We had four kids. You know, I, I'm going to be home with the kids. You know? And I said, look, I'll tell you what. Let's invite that little girl down the street. Let's invite her, a teenager. She can watch the kids and you can come to the meeting. Oh, great. So we hired the girl, paid her whatever. And she, every night she'd come to the meeting. And of course, you know how it is. We're in the church, right? After the gospel meeting, people would come back to our house and we'd talk about it, blah, blah, blah. Anyways, long story short, we didn't get a lot of visitors. We got a couple, you know, but we didn't get a whole lot of visitors. It was fun, it was great for us. We loved being together, fellowship. We heard some great lessons. We were pumped, you know, and we were excited at night. But the entire gospel meeting yielded only one baptism. And do you know who that baptism was? The little girl who baptized our, uh, who watched our kids. She watched us come home every night excited and talking. Oh, that was great. Did you hear what he said? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, OK. I forget what her name was so many years ago. But anyways, you know, and she'd listen and she'd listen. And, she, and then she started asking questions. Anyways, she was baptized. <laughs> she never went to the meetings. She didn't read the literature. She didn't hear the sermons. She just kind of was going off of us. And she was like, Man, I, I, I want what they've got. What, have you, what is it that you people have? I want some of that. So I say that story to remind you, you, it never comes from where you think it's going to come with the Lord. It's always, look, you just minister and I'll add. And you know what? I'm not going to ask your permission on how I'm going to add. I'll add the way and the time that I want to add. You just be convinced that I will add when the time is right. You just keep on ministering. Don't you worry about that. Okay. Quality number five. Growing churches had inspiring worship service. Now here we need to make a distinction between style of worship and inspiring worship. There are a lot of styles of worship services. There's high church you know, with a lot of ceremony, you know, Roman Catholic, Greek Orthodox, that's high church. You have high impact worship with music and performance and lights and cameras and stuff, you know, uh, church.tv or life church, you know, lots of stuff going on. You got the band in the back, you got the guest singer, you got the charismatic evangelist, you know, the lights and everything going on. You have seeker services geared to introduce worship to non-believers. 
you have a cappella style, which is the practice in uh, New Testament churches. Now, what the research showed was that the style did not impact growth one way or another. For all of those people in our congregations that are you know, <laughs> moaning about the fact that the reason we're not growing is because we're a cappella churches, we need to get instruments, we need to you know, start swinging here and rock and rolling here. For all the people that make those arguments, the research shows changing your style of worship is not going to impact your growth. Inspiring worship is that worship where the Holy Spirit of God is truly at work in the worshipers and they are inspired by His presence among them. You cannot manipulate the Spirit of God with your style of worship. You know what that is? That's magic. That's the, that's the basic definition of the occult. Magic is trying to influence something in the spirit world by doing something in the physical world. So you've got the lucky charm that you carry. And what does that mean? Well, you have the lucky charm. The lucky charm means that if you hold it or carry it or whatever, the spirits will give you, quote, good luck, will favor you. What is that? Something in the physical world that's trying to manipulate something that's in the spiritual world. But in the same way, if we think that jumping around and lights and screaming and professional singers with six octave voices and so on and so forth, that that is going to manipulate the Spirit of God to like us better, uh-uh. No. You not only have the, 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 the action wrong, you got the theology wrong. The only factor that style in worship plays is if the worshipers are offering their worship in an acceptable biblical manner and with an acceptable believing heart. If you don't believe that, just go back to the Old Testament and take a look at the relationship between God and His worshipers. Worship is about what God wants, not what we want. And certainly you've heard sermons on that before. I'm not going to repeat them here. The inspiration for worship, however, does not come from externals like the type of building or the talent of the worship leaders, but rather is a dynamic played out between the worshiper and God throughout the week and shared with others on the Lord's Day. If that was not, if that was not the case, that means that the American Pentecostals, okay, only their worship is acceptable because it's so exciting and so impacting and so high energy. And the guy who is living in South America in a small village meeting with six of his brothers and sisters in a, in a hut somewhere or in a place where I have actually been in Haiti. OK, I'll, let's do Haiti. Out in the country in Haiti and again a stick church you know, with 19 people who only know two songs those people's worship is unacceptable. Why? Because they haven't got an electric organ, they got no lights, nobody's shouting, nobody's jumping up and down, nobody's going nuts and rolling on the floor, so therefore their worship must not be any good. Is that the God we worship? Really? Really? If we only could hear the music of the first century. <laughs> it's chanting. It's like three notes. It's reciprocal, sing to each other. It's Jewish, <laughs> nothing like what we have today. So if we think the modern you know, showtime worship style, if that's what pleases God, then all of us are going to hell because man, I mean, I tell you, I can play the accordion, but that's about it. You know? The spin-off benefit of this inspired worship, this worship between me and God, is the overall growth of members who worship because of inspiration and not duty. I, I love to worship God. I love to do it. 
I love to do it. I, you know, the Muslims, they pray five times a day because you know, they have to pray five times a day with the prayer mat facing east and all that kind of stuff, facing Mecca. Man, I got them, I got, I got them whooped. I pray way more times than five times a day. Way more. Not out of duty. Not out of duty. Out of compassion. Out of compulsion. When I open my eyes and, and I switch out of bed and my feet hit the floor, I begin to pray. I begin to pray at that moment. Then I pray at breakfast. Then I pray at work. <laughs> then I have my personal Bible reading time where I pray some more. Then I pray before all my meals. Then I pray with my wife. And, the, and as my head hits the, the pillow at night, the last thing that's going on in my mind is what? Is prayer. I'm praying. Why? Because somebody, some mullah somewhere told me I got to do it five times a day. No. I love God. Period. I love Him. And when I remember what He's done for me, where I was at in my life when He found me, I mean, you don't need to hear my story. It's ugly. It's bad. It's terrible. When I realized that he, while I was making jokes about Him, I personally was making jokes about Him, blasphemous jokes about Him with my buddies while we were doing drugs and alcohol, and whatever else we were into. While I was making those jokes, He was preparing to save me. How can you not love that person? How can prayer be a duty? So take 400 people like me and put them all together in one place. You know how much power that can produce? You know how much spiritual energy that can create? But it can only be created one person at a time. You can't be whipped into love. <laughs> you can't be forced into it. You have to love Him. You have to want to worship Him. All right, number six. Growing churches have holistic small groups. The researchers found that this characteristic truly separated growing from declining churches. Now a lot of churches, you know, they have small groups or they have a program, quote, or another, and they don't experience any significant growth. And that's because the small groups are just one among many programs the ministry staff operates. Well, we got the youth group, we got the gospel meeting, we got the this, we got the that, we got the Sunday night potluck, and then we got the small groups over here. That's usually the way we do it, it's just a program. But holistic small groups, they're different. These small groups are designed to help members use their gifts and share their lives and minister to each other and pray and support each other, not just eat together. <laughs> Fellowship is not about food. It's about sharing Christ. You know what? You know how close you're coming to having a small, effective small group? Don said, hey, anybody after Sunday night church, you know, anybody wants to come here and eat some food and sit down and tackle these five areas of ministry, get some brainstorming? That's a small group. That's a small group with a purpose. That's a small group that's sharing something that's real. And all those people that'll come to that, you know what? They'll be here because they want to. They want to be here. Now others may just have other commitments, other things. We get that. We're not just because I do something doesn't have to make somebody else feel guilty about it. I'm just saying the people that come to that, they're a legitimate small group. Why? Because they have a common interest. They want to get things done. They want to try stuff. Great. And that's what, that's what uh, he's saying. Small groups are designed to help members use their gifts, share their lives, minister to each other, pray and support each other. Uh, Schwartz says there's an enormous difference between church leaders discussing evangelism and loving relationships or gift-oriented ministry in its staff meetings and having Christians integrated into a small group and uh, go through a process in which uh, he or she actually experiences the meaning of these things in real terms within the confines of the group. So if the small group is just meeting to eat, that's one thing, but if the small group is meeting together in this instance to think about how can we evangelize, who's got a good idea and somebody comes up with an idea, oh, everybody gets excited, everybody's on board, well listen, I'll do this, I'll do that, whatever. 
You should have seen our meeting when we talked about the health fair. Are you kidding me? People were so excited. Oh man, a helicopter, we're going to have a helicopter in the parking lot. Uh, and, then we, and then we told the elders and they said, you're going to have a what, where? <laughs> but they were for it. They were for it. So holistic small groups are not just a program, they're a way that the church can train people in ministry and develop leaders to plant new churches. As I said, small groups are nothing new. The research simply points out that when the, these are used to mentor and minister to the saints, the overall church grows. You have that meeting Sunday night and you watch the growth that comes from that and because of that particular meeting. Characteristic number seven, we need to finish here. Um, Growing churches practice need-oriented evangelism. Research in this area revealed a lot of interesting facts. Oh, some of you, please don't be angry now at what I'm going to say. Not everybody has a gift or talent in the area of evangelism. Our mistake, we're trying to get 100% of the church to, to, to serve in evangelism but only really about 10% of the church actually has a gift for evangelism. It's like, let's put it this way, it's like, like saying, okay, 100% of the men in the congregation are all going to lead singing. Would we do a thing like that? Well, no, we recognize, well, some men have, I mean, some women have great voices, but because of our you know, male spiritual leadership concept of the Bible, the, the men are the ones that lead in public worship, so okay. But 100% of the men leading worship, oh man, that might not be a very good idea, right? How about 100% of the men get to preach? Maybe not. 100% of the men pray? Maybe not. 100% of the women teach, uh, in, uh, teach the teenage girls. 100% of the women teach the teenage girls. Really? So why do we think 100% of the church ought to be serving in evangelism. Not everybody has the gift. I mean, we're all responsible to share our faith, but not everybody has the gift of evangelism. And so uh, what, they, what they discovered is that um, uh, only 10% of each church were natural soul winners. It doesn't mean if you're not a natural soul winner, you know, we were talking about the DVD, just give it to somebody else, that's your, you know. but somebody else who has a gift for it could say, you know what, why don't you come on over to my house on Thursday night and I got this great little video here, it's called Christianity for Beginners and I bet you, I bet you there's some interesting stuff that we can talk about together, so come on over, I'll make some coffee, blah, blah, blah. Is everybody like that? I'll tell you something, okay, I'm not like that. I, I, I don't like too many strangers in my house. You know, you know what I'm saying? It's a terrible thing to say, mind you. you know, uh, raised as an only child, it's, 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 it's cultural, it's ingrained, I'm hardwired. I much prefer just being left alone. <laughs> it, it doesn't come naturally to me to say to people, come on, everybody come on over. No, no, I don't want you over to my house. I want peace and quiet when I'm at my house. <laughs> So I'm not the guy that's leading the charge to have barbecues and no, 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 no. But we got people like that at church. Sunday night, come on, Bobby's like that. He has, you know, we have boxing night at his house and we, come on over, you know, let's go, let's do it. Not everybody has the same gifts. Statistics showed, however, that each member had about 8.5 contacts each. I don't know how that half a contact turned out, but I guess it's a math problem. So each member, not each one who's gifted in evangelism, each member in the church has about, statistics show, about eight and a half contacts apiece. In other words, people who were not believers, not members of the church. And they found that these, uh, that these were two factors that promoted growth in the church due to evangelism as opposed to growth by placing membership. First of all, the leaders knew who were gifted in the area of evangelism and they made sure that these people were active in this area. Remember the whole idea? The leaders know who have the gifts, so they know who has the gift of evangelism. They provide them with resources to do their work and then growing churches focused 
in evangelism, not making new friends or developing contacts with strangers, but rather concentrating on the 8.5 contacts that each person already had. In other words, never mind door knocking to people you don't know. Never mind coming up to strangers you don't know on the street. You already have 8.5 natural contacts that you know, growing churches focused on that. Because a person who knows you will be more prepared to listen to you than a stranger. So need-oriented evangelism encourages each Christian to use their gifts and resources to serve non-Christians with whom they have a relationship and see to it that they hear the gospel and have a connection to the local church. That's why we have a Sunday evening thing where we invite people, hey, you don't need to come to services, just come be with us. Get a little taste of what Christian fellowship is like and who we are and feel comfortable, right? We've all, we've all got a couple of people we can invite to church. You use what you have to first serve and share the gospel with folks that you already know. To me that's a great comfort because so many people feel guilty because they're not out door knocking. I mean if you, got, if you got to heaven because you were a door knocker, man I wouldn't be going. But you know what? I found a way to do it. This is my way, the internet. You know, I found my way to do it. I'm still getting the message across. And we get feedback. People write to us. and We get letters and emails back from people who use our material. Thank you. God bless you. I'm sharing it with my husband or with my neighbor or whatever. You know, that's great. That's terrific. That's what I can do. So I'm not going to feel guilty about the stuff I can't do. I'm only going to feel guilty about the stuff that I can do, but I don't do. See the difference? Because I know that this church belongs to God. And if He wants to raise up a door knocker, He'll do it, because it's not going to be me. If He wants to raise up a good teacher for the third grade kids, He will raise up that person. That person will be found. All right, last thing. All growing churches had a an abundance of loving relationship. Growing churches, you know, they have a high love quotient. Declining churches have a low love quotient. Does this seem strange to us? That the God of love would be worshipped by a church of love? Would it be biblical if we called our church the Ponca City Church of Love? Would that be true? Might be weird. <laughs> The research showed over and over again that a loving church is more powerful than an evangelistic church or a busy church or a church that quote holds the truth. When I go home I go by a certain street and there's a sign there. Okay? And on that sign it says the disciples of truth with an arrow up this street. Imagine saying that. We're the disciples of truth. We're the only ones that have this, this truth. Now don't get me wrong, the church needs to evangelize, it needs to minister, it needs to speak the truth, but Paul the Apostle says, the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. You hear that? The goal, what we're shooting for in what we teach people is that people have love from a pure heart and a good conscience. So, if a church claims to be evangelistic or busy and a pillar of the truth, but is deficient in love, then there is something missing. There's some teaching or attitude that is incorrect because where the Spirit of Christ is, there is love. People come to Christ and His church because of the gospel and because of ministry and teaching. But I'll tell you, brothers and sisters, people stay in the body because of love. So when I was 30 years old, I had been on the road for two years. When I mean on the road, I mean wandering around, traveling around by bus, by train, across Canada, down the United States, looking at different religious things, not working, working odd jobs. You know. And I told you my story. I, I, I went to this, this church you know, that said sinners are welcome at the Church of Christ and that that was interesting. You know, I read the article, Jesus loves sinners, so on and so forth. And I, I went, I checked it out. Oh, you should have seen me. I don't know if you would have really liked me if I came into your church when I, you know, 
35, 36 years ago. Because I walked in, I had jeans, a jean jacket, a black shirt, sunglasses, cigarettes in my pocket. And I sat in the back. I hated the music. I hated the music. I mean, really. I, not the words, the music. Because I like jazz, I still do, you know, Brubeck and Davis and all these guys, that's who I like, you know. So I go in and I hear the music. What a friend we have in Jesus. Country and Western music. <laughs> I, no, no, I, I'm, I'm not making fun of the, of the words, mind you, but the, the music is just, it's country and Western, it's what it is. And the way it was being sung, you know, I despised it. But here's the thing. So I walk in, not too sure of what's going on, and this lady comes up to me, and her name is Hemsey Brown. Hemsey Brown from Jamaica. And she says, you come over here and sit next to me, son. You know, okay. and I sit next to her, you know, and, and she took out the song book and showed me the song, and she said, now, you know, they're not all like this, those songs. We have other kinds of songs. And then when they had the communion, she says, now the, the, the trays are going to come around. You know, if you want, you, know, you can take the bread you know, and, and then it'll come around again. And she sat there with me and then she handed me a little uh, bulletin so I could kind of follow along. And then it was all over and she gave me a hug and she said, so will you come back? Maybe. Maybe, I said. Okay, she said. I'll be here. And she was. My first contact in the Church of Christ. A divorced nurse, mother of three, Jamaican lady, who had this nice sing-song way of talking. No love, no growth. Because when people come to you, they're not looking for theology. They're looking for love. That little girl who's got two kids and her husband dumped her and now she's got to make ends meet and she's tired all the time and somebody invites her to church and so on and so forth. Do you think she cares for one minute? For one single minute, do you think she cares that we don't use instruments in our worship? You think she cares about that? You think, she, you think she cares that, about male spiritual leadership or that we, we're a New Testament church? You think she really cares about any of that? The only thing she cares about is, are these people going to love me? Are they going to accept me? I've got a blown up marriage, I've got two kids. And you know what, these two kids, I've had them by different men. And one is kind of black and the other one is white. You know, are they going to love me? Can I find a spot here for me? And she'll be able to tell by your faces. She'll be able to tell, she'll know. There'll be time to teach the word, absolutely. And there'll be time to explain why we do the things the way we do them. And there'll be time to answer the question. You know, I noticed that it's just men that go up there to pray and to do, why is that? There'll be time for that. But if there's no love, I guarantee you there'll be no time to teach. So growing churches, growing churches are churches of love. So there they are, the eight essential characteristics for growing churches, principles that can be applied to any church, anywhere. I could preach this sermon anywhere. They're biblically based. They have been statistically proven through the most extensive survey ever conducted on church growth. There they are, all eight of them. Empowering leadership, gift-oriented ministry, passionate spirituality, functional structures, inspiring worship, holistic small groups, need-oriented evangelism, and loving relationships. Now most churches have some or all of these characteristics to a greater degree. The point of the research was that growing churches had all of these and they had them in abundance. So the invitation you know, for this lesson is not you know, repent and be baptized, not preaching the gospel. The invitation is, do you want to be a growing congregation? And if you do, this, these are the principles that you have to cultivate. 
And this, the pattern, is the structure that you need to be based on. You combine these two things, there'll be nothing stopping you, nothing at all. This will be a leadership church. People will be coming here to watch what you do and how you do it.